Hello, everybody. Here we are again, joining together in yet another opportunity to study God's Word via WOW Live, Word on Wednesdays Live. Tonight, we begin a study of the Apostle Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica. So we're just moving right along. We have three chapters, basically, left in this study. Don't know that we'll get through chapter 2 in one uh, fell swoop next uh, Wednesday night or not, maybe. But uh, there's some extra material in there that's worth taking a good look at. Ties in with some of the things we've been saying in the, in the sermon series as well at the church. So anyhow, it doesn't mean we'll be finished in, in, in just uh, three weeks, counting tonight. So uh, may stretch out a little bit. So, But tonight's going to be kind of short. And if um, I, I'm doing okay and everything goes well, uh, if we have some time left at the end, I have something I just just discovered and just, just happened to be reading a little bit before, just uh, minutes ago. And, and it's like uh, one of those light bulb moments where things just like, wow, this is cool. And so I'm, if there's time left, I'd like to share with you a little bit of what I got and we'll see how that goes. It'll be kind of uh, hit and miss and, and all done uh, uh, off the cuff, you know, no no practice or plan or anything like that. So, uh, but but that's the way I said this would probably be as we, as we move forward a lot more open. And so we'll see how that goes, see if we have some time to get that in. Um, anyhow, tonight we're going to uh, take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the very first chapter. And here are the first couple of verses of that chapter. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Silvanus, who is this Silvanus character? Well, Silvanus is actually the Roman name for Silas, Paul's partner in uh, the missionary trips, second and third ones anyway. Silas went with him. So this letter is coming from Paul and from Silas and, of course, from Timothy. Those were the same three who originally came into Thessalonica and got the church started there. They went to the synagogue. Paul taught in the synagogue for three weeks, and then they ran into some trouble. Um, as we learned before as well, Timothy went back to Thessalonica, Okay, but to check in on the church there, and he reported back to Paul, and then Paul mentioned that report from Timothy in his first letter that he sent to the church there in Thessalonica. And here we see the church is, let's see, let's go back to the, to the verse slide here. The church is in God, our Father. And also the church is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this positional thing in the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit makes that possible, of course, being the Holy Spirit is the one who unites the church together. And it is from God the Father and Jesus Christ that grace and peace come. You realize it's because of God's grace that we also experience his peace. And we'll be talking about some of those kinds of things with God's grace here in a little bit. Paul is well known in his letters for his very, very long sentences, okay? And the sentence in verses 3 through 8 uh, from the New King James Version has 153 English words in it. That's quite, uh, that, that's like a paragraph, not just a, a sentence. And so Paul's famous for these sort of run-on sentences, if you will. Let's go through this uh, verse by verse, okay? Uh, verse 3 says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds uh, well, it's every one of you all, because Paul was Southern, I think. Uh, and the love of every one of you all bounds toward each other. Abounds toward each other. I'll, I'll get reading straightened out here before too long. The word bound there means to be indebted, to be obligated, owed. In a number of places in the New Testament, it's translated as the word ought. 
Uh, it's used in this familiar passage, for example, Ephesians 5.28 at the bottom of the slide there. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Paul is duty-bound. Uh, it's what he ought to do. He owes it to the Thessalonian believers to thank God for them. It's fitting and right that he should do so, he says. Well, why? Because they are evidencing growth in their faith. In fact, he says their faith is growing exceedingly or abundantly, increasingly above measure. I think such language as this demonstrates that the apostle believes their faith to be a genuine faith. Their faith grows by supernaturally extraordinary means. Faithfulness, after all, is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And another fruit of the Spirit, the first one on the list, of course, is love. And Paul says he also owes gratitude to God for the Thessalonian Christians because their love for each other abounds. 2 Thessalonians verse 4 says that because their faith is growing so much and because they love each other so much, they have made it so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul uses these people's faith as an example when he's talking to other churches. It's, it's like he says, you won't believe how strong the faith of the believers in Thessalonica is. Folks, that's the kind of faith all of us need. Their faith has been made evident out of tribulations and persecutions that they've gone through. We've seen it, you know. That's what Paul is saying to these other churches here about this church in Thessalonica. A real, honest-to-goodness, authentic faith. A disingenuous faith, a fake faith, will fail whenever the going gets tough. That's a spiritual principle. That's how God weeds out the fakers. I believe this is how God preserves his faithful remnant. Look at these words here from, uh, of Jesus that come to us from John 15 also talking about spiritual uh, fruit and so forth. John 15, verses 4 through 6. Jesus says to them, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Just like a branch can do nothing without the vine, right? If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. Folks, we need to abide in Jesus in order to bear fruit. Now, that, that requires faith. We need to trust that Jesus, by means of the Holy Spirit, is going to infuse us with that which we need in order to produce the kind of fruit that he desires. Just as a vine, or a branch rather, is dependent upon what the vine supplies to grow the fruit at the end of the branch. And in this case, it's spiritual fruit on us, the branches. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all from Galatians 5.22. Now, here's the thing, see, uh, as we talk about uh, this, this, uh, this faith, genuine faith versus fake faith. If a person claiming to be a fo follower of Jesus is not abiding in Christ... Well, that person is going to be cast out. That's what this passage is telling us. And I believe this casting out comes about whenever there is tribulation or persecution. 
In other words, these people uh, leave Christ when things get tough. So they leave Christ of their own volition. They choose to go. They can't stand the heat, right? So they get out of the kitchen. And you know, sometimes I think that it is entire church organizations that leave. If we don't find a way to deal with these Bible verses here, uh, you know, I mean, I can imagine them saying, you know, if, if we don't find a way to deal with these Bible verses which speak about aberrant sexual practices, to reinterpret these verses in such a way that sounds much more acceptable to the people in our present culture, well, if we can't find a way to do that, well, then we're going to look and we're going to sound like we're uncaring, like we don't really, aren't really loving. We're going to, we're going to lose people who are offended then by these verses, and then we're going to lose money, and we can't have that. Now, the folks who are leading those major church organizations and denominations and the like won't exactly say it out loud in public using those exact words, but I'm reasonably certain that those words or something very similar summarize their internal logic. We don't want to lose people because it will... Uh, stifle our uh, income, okay? That's their way of measuring fruit, you see. All this to say that they may well persist beyond their departure from what the Scripture says in, in organizations and local outlets uh, that, that look like, quote, Christian denominations and churches, end quote. But you see, they have removed themselves from Christ if they leave the Word. And they're obviously not abiding in him. And I can hear the protests with my mind's ear clearly already. There's, there's not a single word here in the context of John 15 dealing with aberrant sexual behaviors. So what you're saying, Brian, is therefore unbiblical because it's been improperly exegeted. You're finding stuff in that chapter that's not even there. You know, where's, there's nothing in that context that you just read. Well then, uh, you, you know, you might have a point. You might have a point. So let's do this. Let's, let's expand, shall we? Uh, let's expand the John 15 context just simply by adding two more verses. Verses 7 and 8. What exactly do they say? Jesus says in verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And then by this... My Father is glorified. By what? That you ask for stuff and you get it? No. My, that my Father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So here's the thing, you see. For the one who would be a disciple of Jesus, for the one who would bear much fruit that would glorify the Father, such a one must abide in in Jesus, and Jesus' words must abide in you. Now, for those who may be criticizing my interpretation here by talking about aberrant sexual behavior, here's what has happened. Your task has now become one of convincing me where, in the inspired word of God, that Jesus' words stop and human opinions take over. Because it says here, my words abide in you. If my words abide in you, you will be my disciples, okay? Because you'll be bearing much fruit because the word brings that about, see? So you, 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 if my words are abiding in you. So if you can find a place where Jesus' words stop and then human opinions take over, well, then, then maybe, you know, that we don't have to worry about those verses that say things like, well, like this passage does in, in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. See, that's aberrant sexual behavior there. For even their woman ex women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So when the Bible 
which is God-breathed, meaning it's God-inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay? So when the Bible says that, says, says this, as we see in Romans 1 here, when it says that, are those words that you see on the screen before you, are they the words of Jesus? It's not an exact quote, but are they the words of Jesus? Jesus, who is God? Are these words on your screen the words of God? Is that how you see them? Should those words abide in us, being believed by us to be true and so, and, and to be as, serve as a guide and a, and a means of understanding the world around us? Should, should they abide in us for us to be Jesus' disciples? based upon what Jesus said in John 15? Or, or do we have to reinterpret these words to mean something other than what they are obviously saying in order to maybe, okay, maybe make the words more palatable, to make them more acceptable to our contemporary culture? Do we change what the Word of God says to satisfy the people around us. See, the real question now becomes, do I have the faith to trust God and what he has said, and then to live it out accordingly, to live based on it, to see things based upon what his word says, trusting the Holy Spirit to produce the kind of fruit that he desires? See, that's what Paul is saying about the ever-growing, abundant faith of these Thessalonians. And by the way, aberrant sexual behavior was an issue in their culture, too. It's not just uh, some modern phenomenon. Let's move on to uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, okay? What's it say there? In verse 4... Paul has commended the Thessalonians for their patience and their, their faith uh, in the face of their persecutions and their tribulations. And Paul points out their endurance, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. So here we learn that their suffering is for the kingdom of God. Paul says that their patience and faithful endurance of their persecution serves as obvious, manifest evidence of God's righteous judgment. So it seems here that not only is judgment of God upon sin and evil, as we normally understand it when we think of the judgment of God, it seems there is also judgment of God uh, to reward well-doing, to pass a positive judgment upon someone. Here, here God's judgment, uh, we, we might say God's assessment of their patient endurance of persecution his assessment may result in them being counted worthy of God's coming kingdom. Now, it's their faith that ultimately accounts for them being worthy of the coming kingdom of God. Okay? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Same thing applies here. So it doesn't mean that they must work up within themselves enough faith, you know, kind of gin it up and just say, oh boy, I sure hope so. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And, and they, they, they gin up enough faith inside to make it to heaven. That's not what this is talking about. We know that because of what Paul says elsewhere in the book of Ephesians. Okay, chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved. Remember, grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the works lest anyone should boast. See, folks, we are saved from God's wrath. And we are preserved for his kingdom by his grace. Meaning, 
by what he has done for us, not by what we can or should do for ourselves, because we can't do it no matter how much we think we ought to. We access his grace on our behalf. We access his grace through faith. And look at this verse. Look what it says, that the faith is not even of ourselves. This faith is also a gift of God, just like his grace. And in case we don't get the message, Paul emphasizes in verse 9 that our salvation does not come to us by the works which we do. Otherwise, as he says, people would boast about how they earned their way into heaven. I'm earning my way into heaven. I'm doing all the right things. Uh, let's now take a look at verses 6 through 8 in Second Thessalonians 1. In these next few verses now, Paul is going to bring up the subject of Jesus' second coming. As I've said before, each chapter in these two letters to the Thessalonian church refers to the second coming in some way or other. So here is the second major clause in Paul's 153 word long sentence. This is verses 6 through 8, 2 Thessalonians 1. Since it is a righteous thing with God, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says elsewhere in Romans 12 and verse 19, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And see, this same principle is expressed in verse 6 in this passage. God is going to repay with tribulation those who trouble and persecute his people. So let's just review here for a quick moment. The, the, the Thessalonians are commended by Paul in this letter for their exceeding and abundant growth of their faith their trust, their abiding in the words of Jesus, right? As they endure with faith and patience the tribulation and the persecution heaped upon them by other people. You know, from a few weeks ago, we learned that this persecution initially came from among Jews in the synagogue in Thessalonica who did not like what the Apostle Paul was teaching them about Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah and telling them that the Messiah had to suffer and then rise from the dead. You can find all of this in the first few verses of Acts chapter 17, if you want to look it up again. Acts 17. Now, when these opposing Jews couldn't find Paul and his missionary team at the house of Jason in Thessalonica, they drugged Jason, along with some other believers, new believers, uh, down to the Polytarchs. Remember those guys? The rulers of the city. The Polytarchs. That's the word Luke uses. It's exclusive, really, to the Thessalonican situation, apparently. So he knew what he was talking about. It's authentic history we read here. And he, t he, they took them down there to get them in trouble with the Roman government. See, this is what we must understand here, then. These people in Thessalonica were therefore being persecuted, and they were being troubled for the doctrine, for the teaching, for the words which they believed about Jesus. That's why they were being drugged in there, because the Jews did not like what Paul was teaching. Okay? Not to once again go through everything I just said earlier this evening, but remember that we are held to be disciples of Jesus when we abide in Jesus and when his words abide in us. Now, according to what I'm seeing here in First Corinthians or First Corinthians, Second Thessalonians even, one verses six through eight, those who would bring persecution against us because the words of Jesus abide in us, those folks will be repaid by God. Uh, that's what it says in, in, in verse uh, 6 there. God's going to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Um, and, and, and it's going to be in form of their own tribulation that they're going to face. And this serves as a warning to those who are coming against us because of our beliefs. 
Uh, God does. You, you, you should be warned. I don't know if any will be listening to this, but you should be warned. God does exact vengeance when his children are attacked. It's not something I have control over. I can pray for mercy for those who would attack me. Pray that God is gracious there, merciful. Forgive them for they really don't know what they're doing. But God does exact vengeance when his children are attacked, and there is coming a time of tribulation on this earth. Tribulation at the hands of God. There will be a time of reckoning, a time of judgment. We're told here that God's children will receive rest from their trials, while those who persecuted them will suffer trouble and tribulation themselves. According to this passage we've looked at here, this tribulation will come, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Notice here, this tribulation will fall upon those who do not know God, down in verse 8, near the bottom of the slide. He'll fall upon those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Believers are not part of the time of tribulation. Take note of that. The tribulation falls upon those who do not believe. And I think this supports the idea that the true church, the bride of Christ, will be raptured before this tribulation begins. The tribulation is not for the church. It's for those who do not believe. Now, there may be people who were in a church who didn't believe and are still left behind after the rapture. That's a different horse, okay? A different colored horse, okay? This contrast between the punishment uh, of unbelievers and the glorification of believers is now further emphasized in verses 9 and 10 of 2 Thessalonians 1. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes, in that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Please note this. Unbelievers will not be in the presence of God as they will be experiencing everlasting destruction, not everlasting life. Any who might hold the notion of a universal salvation for all people, they must come to grips with what this passage is saying right here. Everlasting destruction means everlasting. There's no redemption from it at that point. There's no turning away from it. There's no repenting and, and being accepted at that point. Everlasting destruction means everlasting. And I want you to see as well the opening phrase of verse 10 there. When he comes in that day. When he comes in that day. This is important to understand because when we get to chapter 2 the next time, we're going to see how confusion about the day of the Lord in the church in Thessalonica is an issue that Paul will address. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit led him to mention it here uh, as a precursor to what he's about to say. And again, underscoring the significance of believing all the word of God to be the very word of God, we have the last part of verse 10 there, and I shouldn't have moved it away, but here's what it says. Because our testimony among you was believed. You see, it is faith in the testimony. It is faith in God's word. Taking his word for what it says in all matters, and doing that with all of his word. That is what undergirds us in our glorification as his saints. To take it back a few verses here. And then for these final words in this chapter. Verses 11 and 12. Therefore, we also pray. Remember he said he was praying for them. We also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. And that worth comes from Christ. If we're abiding in him, if we're believing him, if we're trusting him, and we have placed our trust in him, 
then we pray that all of you would be count, counted worthy of this calling, that all of you know him, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, what he pleases as good, what makes him pleased, uh, his goodness being matched to his goodness, and the work of faith with power, that, it, that the faith that he gives to us, and that we tr when we trust in him, it produces power in our lives to produce good fruit, you see. That's the, that's the energy coming up through from the branch, or from the, from the vine to the branches. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome, awesome passage indeed. That's just simply a fantastic chapter. Um, just really impressed with the positive things that Paul says to these, these Thessalonian believers. Um, uh, just uh, the, the testimony that they must have had and, and everything else. Wow. So now it's like a total gear shift here, and I'm, you know, forgive me for scratching my ear, and this is where it gets a little uh, uh, off the cuff, a little ad lib here, because I was just doing some interesting reading, and, and this kind of goes back to, um, to what, something we talked about months and months ago, uh, back when I was uh, uh, doing uh, the, the study on the giants in the Bible. Um, and I have here a book that I've been, been reading. Uh, it's kind of a thick volume, you can see there. And the title of the book is Corrupting the Image. Okay, And down there at the bottom it says Hybrids, Hades, and the Mount Hermon Connection. So, uh, and, I'm, and I'm getting near the end of the book. You can see I've read uh, this much of it, right, and I've still got about this much to go. So we got more read than than, than we don't than we have not read. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading this this chapter 18, and, and I've just been reading at it to to work my way through it, and it's called "Darkness Fights the Light," and it's kind of interesting because I never really made this connection before. Let me start uh, by by reading to you. Um, from Matthew chapter 4. This, I'm just going to read out of his, his book, so I'm using the translation that he's got in here. Matthew chapter 4. Uh, basically what he says here, Matthew tells us that after the testing, okay, that would be the testing that, that Satan put him through, Jesus was, quote, leaving Nazareth. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's Matthew 4, verse 13. Jesus knew, the writer says here, this is Douglas Hamp, by the way, I should have told you that. Jesus knew that the Sanhedrin and the influential rabbis were down in Jerusalem. So you're thinking, you know, he's the Messiah, why doesn't he go there? However, Jesus didn't, did not go to Jerusalem to try to make reforms to the religious leaders. Instead, he went to the front line of the war. Now, see, that's something I, I had never really considered before. You know, in, in my human way of thinking, I, I think, well, he didn't want to go right into Jerusalem, make a stir right away. Uh, he, he, see, he, he was kind of like playing some softball a little bit with the, the people in the northern realms, and then he was going to come down and play hardball with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, the Sanhedrin and all those Jewish leaders, right? That's my human way of thinking, but it, it's totally wrong. Matthew says, this was to fulfill... Okay, he goes to move in this region, to live in this region up in the, in the Galilee region. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali. Okay, those are two tribes of Israel. And they had their land allotted to them uh, by Joshua in, in the uh, uh, northern region of, of this area, up around Galilee and so, so forth, Zebulun and Naphtali. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali along the sea road beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. It's Galilee of the Gentiles. It's a Gentile realm. Now look at this. Listen to this. The people 
who live in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus, of course, is the great light. But the people are living in darkness. And for those living in the shadow land of death, light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So, what's going on with this? Let's take a look at a map. Now, this is going to be um, a little bit difficult. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to change over to some slides, and this is where it gets a little bit like a break in the thing. But be thinking about Zebulun and Naphtali, would you? And um, let's open up another slideshow here from months ago. Just a little bit of time. Hum some uh, uh, elevator music to yourself, I guess, while we're <laughs> waiting on this to come up. Hopefully it won't give me too much trouble. Let me clear that and then go looking for the, uh, the stuff that I want. Okay, there's our Giants in the Land lesson. And then we come down here to a lesson that was called the Giant Clan. We did this back in, in uh, December, middle of December uh, of last year. And let's see if we can get this to open up. Okay, so if we can get these PowerPoint slides to load up fairly decently, I'll have a, a map for you. Let me just, while we're doing that, um, let me show you here. Um, what's going on? This is a, um, a map of Israel. You can sort of see it. Here's the Mediterranean Sea over here, right? Here's the, uh, the Dead Sea down here in the valley, and up here is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan Valley all the way running down through there as the river goes down through. Up here at the very top, right at that point, and I know you can't really see too well. Yeah, it's a total glare on there. Uh, up at this point at the very top, we have to lean uh, uh, Israel over a little bit. But that's Mount Hermon right up there, the real tall mountain. You can sort of see, if I turn it that way, you can see how high that is on this relief map. And that's uh, where we're at. See, here's the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is right up and around here. Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, is right in about here. So there's uh, Capernaum over this way. And then we go this direction, and there's on this other little hillside right in there. Up on the peak of that, actually, is where Nazareth is at. And then way up here is Mount Hermon. <laughs> okay, I get my dis disoriented trying to follow the map. Up here is Mount Hermon. And then this is, Nazareth is in the land of Zebulun. Okay, so that's why I was pointing that out. That's Nazareth right there. That's in the, the land of Zebulun. Naphtali is, is around the Galilee region, right in around through here. Okay, now let me get a map and, and on here that I can show you now. I think, it, yes, it came up here. Let's uh, throw this up on the screen. All right, so now we're going to go through. See, there's lots of slides for these. Remember all this? Oh, those guys are great. Um, and Giants in the Earth in those days, Genealogy of Noah. And uh, we did all kinds of things. There's the grapes that they found, giant grapes and giant people okay in in the land when they came into the land and everything the rephaim and the zuzim and the emim uh kush begot nimrod he began to be a mighty man in the earth there's something about nimrod that's kind of strange he, he began to be a mighty man a gibberim and that's what the nephilim were called back in genesis here we go let's see that's now uh, that's down in the south okay that's the the uh the dead sea and so forth and uh, so we're coming into some maps here Og the giant up in Bashan okay that's 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 Bashan's the region up there that a lot of this has taken place in around Mount Hermon okay here we go this is the 25th slide and I can't I wish I had a pointer here to show you but you can see the Sea of Galilee up at the top and immediately to, to the right of that as you're looking at it you'll see Bashan listed there okay now this is an old testament map so you won't find like nazareth uh, but sea of galilee based on what we just saw with capernaum if you look to the mountain ridges over to the 
um, west or, in your perspective, left of the Sea of Galilee, you'll see some mountain ridges over there on top of one of those peaks of the mountain ridge. Uh, it's not up, up above the Sea of Galilee, but down below it. That's where Nazareth would be sitting. That's the land of Zebulun, and Naphtali is around the Sea of Galilee. And then you have Bashan over there, the, 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 the land of the Gentiles, okay, Bashan. Bashan is interesting um, because it means the, the land of the serpent, the land of the snake. Okay, and, and it, it's, it's the, uh, also called the land of the giants. We don't have uh, Mount Hermon in this picture, but we saw where it was north of this region by about 20 to 25 miles, okay? Up to the top peak of Mount uh, of Hermon. That is where, according to uh, the story in Enoch, that's where the, uh, the watchers came down, rebelled against God, and that's, they're the ones who were the sons of God who came into the daughters of men before the time of the flood, and they bear children to them, which became the Nephilim and, and the giant races in an effort to destroy and to stop the Son of God. So when Doug Hamp says that uh, Jesus goes to the north to the, the, the line of battle, see the line of battle is not in Jerusalem with these Jewish leaders. The line of battle is up here in this region in the north. Galilee, when Jesus gets there, Galilee, according to Doug Hamp, has lots of demons in there. He uh, says at the beginning of this chapter that I was just reading, before this is right before what I was reading, when Jesus began his ministry, there were hordes of demons in Galilee. They were concentrated in the Galilee because they were worshipped in the shadow land of the snake dragons. Okay, see, this is where the snake comes in, the serpent, the land of the serpent, the snake dragons. They had gained dominance in the very place where Satan commanded the sons of God to descend and begin their genetic warfare, uh, to, to corrupt the human seed line, to prevent the seed of the woman from coming. Okay, um, that's what he's basically talking about there. But it never occurred to me that this, this is why Jesus goes there in the first place. As he begins his public ministry, he heads to Galilee. He's baptized somewhere in the Jordan, goes into the wilderness, and then heads to Galilee. Right? That's kind of the order of events here in Matthew. Let's go back over to this slide once. Um, Bashan there. And if you go to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee, probably right up there somewhere above the, the H in the word Bashan, just a little distance uh, slightly north of that H. You come to a, a, a place called Gilgal Rephaim. Okay, and uh, I was looking at this tonight as after I read some of these things from, uh, from uh, Doug Hamp's book. There's Bashan again with another map. Some more things here. Oh, this is where uh, we were talking about this a little while ago in one of the sermons. Uh, with Melchizedek, and uh, uh, yeah, that's going to and, and, and uh, Zedekiah the king, and then this other guy Zedek, uh, his Adonai Zedek. That's who it was, Adonai Zedek. He was one of the kings coming down through here. Uh, that this is when the sun stood still. Okay, and uh, the, they they got these kings and cornered them, and. Uh, and it was in Gilgal, which is not the same area as Gilgal Rephaim up, up north. But uh, Gilgal means circle, really. So circle would show up a lot of places. And let's see. We keep going here. There's the hailstones that came. And then the sun stayed all day. And these kind of things were happening so Joshua could have the victory. Uh, there's the, the big map. And then we're coming in on the Sea of Galilee. Here's the looking at the King Og of Bashan, <laughs> uh, how big he is compared to an ordinary man. Uh, there's Gilgal Rephaim, okay? Now you can sort of see about where it, where it was. Actually, I guess it's north of the A. So I was off by a little bit. But there's, there's Gilgal Rephaim on the map. All right, what's Gilgal Rephaim? Well, this is what it looks like from the ground. All right, the stones and everything. 
on the ground. Uh, and you can tell they're kind of, it's like, it's like stone fencing in sort of a pattern of some kind. But when you see it from the air, oops, that's what it looks like. Okay, you see that from the air, there's what it looks like. This is some kind of worship area. It's called the Circle of the Giants. Rephaim is a word that is used for giants sometimes. And Gilgal, like I said, is circle. This is the Circle of the Giants in the land of the serpent. Bashan. Okay, and, and uh, th this, is, this is up there. We had this in one of the sermons too rather recently. And I showed you this picture where you have the, that circle in the center there. That's the, the Gilgal Raphaim from an even greater distance. And you can see a serpent mound just to the north of there. That's something that is built by, by, by intelligent beings. It's not built by, uh, or not the, a natural formation. That was made to look like a serpent. And it looks to me like a serpent who is guarding the seed, the seed of the giants, the seed of the serpent. Okay, uh, I will put enmity, God says, between your seed and her seed. Her seed being uh, the Savior, the Messiah, the seed of the woman. And your seed would be the progeny that you produce, these, these giants and so forth, through fallen angels. Okay, and it looks like the serpent there is guarding the seed. And then we talked about the, uh, um, the serpent mound in Ohio, which is what we're looking at here. And it's rather interesting because this serpent, if you look up in there, the, the, where the circle is, that red circle, that's the head of the serpent. Look, its jaws are wide open. That round oval thing is not part of the serpent. That is an egg, a seed that the serpent is swallowing, the seed of the woman. In one picture, a serpent is destroying seed. In the other, it appears to be guarding a seed. Very, very interesting in light of the verse, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. Uh, you shall bruise his heel and he will crush your head. Okay, it goes the other way around. There you can see the, the seed being swallowed by the serpent head a little better in that picture. And there's a, a, an artist's rendition of it which shows it in even more detail what's going on in that Ohio's serpent mound. So all very, very interesting there. Uh, and another picture in the wintertime, just to give you a clear idea. So, um, L.A. Marzulli there, and now me. So, what, interesting. Now, here, here's, here's some more just from, from Doug Hamp's book, and then I'm going to uh, bring this to a conclusion. But this is just what I found fascinating. Jesus is up there in the land of the north. He's close to these regions we were just looking at. There are a lot of demons in Galilee, and we do see that in evidence as we read through the Gospels. Okay, different people, demon-possessed and so forth. It's like there is a conglomeration there. And if you would, even the, uh, the uh, uh, man possessed by a legion of demons is on just on the other side of the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So, um, again, bearing witness to that. When Jesus and his disciples come down from the mountain uh, where he is transfigured, which happens to believe to be the, uh, I believe, to be the Mount, Mount Hermon where these um, angels uh, of God fell and descended to and began this rebellion before the flood, that's where Jesus goes to be transfigured to show not only his disciples, but to demonstrate to them as well who he is and why they need to fear. And he comes down from that mountain, and the first thing they do is they go to a synagogue and they encounter a young man who is possessed by a demon. Uh, th this happens constantly. If you look for the warfare in the background as you read these stories, it's, it's just incredible. So, anyhow... So Doug Hamp goes on to say here, after uh, looking at the Matthew 4, 14 to 17, which concluded with repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near, he goes and asks next, what did Isaiah mean concerning the people of Zebulun and Naphtali living in darkness and the shadow land of death? Isaiah revealed that these people were recommending that everyone... This is, uh, everyone consult the spirits of the dead and the spiritists who chirp and mutter. This is, this, that's a quote directly from Isaiah. 
And then he goes on, whereas Isaiah rightfully answered, shouldn't a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Isaiah 8, 19. Okay, that's chapter 8. Okay, uh, this passage on um, where he quotes from uh, Isaiah in the land of Naphtali, that's, that's Isaiah chapter 9. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9. So th- these things about consulting their God on, uh, instead of consulting the dead on behalf of the living. He then states how they need to go to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah 8.20. And further warns from chapter 8, verses 20 to 22, If they do not speak according to this word, there will be no dawn for them. Again, notice the power of the Word of God, as we were talking about in the other lesson. They will wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward, will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. So, it's after this warning, he says, that Isaiah adds that in the territories of Zebulun and Naphtali, a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. Jesus was raised in Nazareth, which was in the region of Zebulun. It was a small landlocked territory, and hence, can anything good come from Nazareth was a reasonable question. Naphtali was next to the Sea of Galilee and adjacent to the land of Bashan and Mount Hermon. As we've seen, Og was king of the Bashan, the land of snake dragons. Furthermore, his name meant death. And according to Ugaritic text, a deified dead king ruled from Ashtoreth and Edri, which were the headquarters of Og, according to Deuteronomy 1.4. So consulting the dead, all these things as part of this uh, little discovery I made tonight. And I just wanted to share that with you to get some uh, idea, a more well-rounded picture of what's going on when Jesus comes to this earth. And, and, and what he's, he's doing, he's not just coming to, um, to, to save us from our sins, which of course he is. That's the victory he accomplishes over sin, death, and hell, and Satan. Okay, all that goes together. He, makes, he, he conquers, he makes that victory. We read in, in the uh, book of Peter that when he resurrects from the dead uh, after three days, he goes to the spirits who were in prison to proclaim to them, to preach to them. To preach what? That now they're finally free? No, to preach them that they're in prison for a good reason. These are the spirits who had committed this, this heinous act with the daughters of, of, of men. And he goes down and proclaims to them, I have now conquered. Your time is, is running short. You're not getting out of this abyss prison. There's no hope that that your leader, Satan, is going to win. That's that's the whole message of what's going on in Jesus' ministry on earth as well as what he has done for us in his grace and in his mercy. We have a great and mighty and powerful God who is fighting on all fronts for our on our behalf to deliver us unto him that we may be glorified at his saints to bring glory to him, our Heavenly Father. Grace and peace be to you tonight. Thank you so much for for listening in to this. Uh, We'll see you next week. Okay, bye.